Hello there. In this video, I'm going to be making the second part of my review on the Fenersi 2C 23T multifunction oscilloscope multimeter and signal generator. In the first video, I did a teardown and hardware review, but in this second video, I'm going to be looking at the functionality and the performance. I'd like to just point out that I'm in no way affiliated with Fenersi. I bought this device by myself, so you can expect an open and transparent review. The software reviewed in this video is version 2.0.2. .2. So any issues we might find along the way may well be resolved by the time that you come to use this software. So have a look at the version that you have in your device or the latest available on Furnace's website. Um, you may find a later version which resolves any issues. Also, at the end of this video, I will go through the steps required to download and install new firmware. Well, before we get stuck into today's video, I'd like to give a big thank you for our sponsor, PCBWay. PCBWay are my number one go-to for PCBs, and they have an incredible range of capabilities, not only for PCB manufacturing, but also other types of manufacturing, such as sheet metal, CNC, and 3D printing. PCBWay can offer you an instant quote for your PCB designs, and even offer the facility to assemble the boards for you. In addition, they have a really interesting community for makers in their shared project section. And if you place your order throughout December 2023, you can benefit from up to 50% off and Christmas coupons. For more information, please visit pcbway.com. Now, I must admit, this video took me a lot longer than I expected, but then it goes to show there's an awful lot of stuff packed in this little device and therefore good value for money, I suppose. So here's the different sections and the, the timings. So if you want to jump in on other sections, take note and uh, you can just move around as you wish. First off, the manual. Actually, Finursi do a good job with their manuals. I've got no complaints, apart from this one's looking a bit dog-eared and falling apart already. Um, it's translated into six languages and I would strongly recommend uh, referring to the latest copy on Finursi's website. Just download yourself a copy. I did notice a few typos in this version that I've got um, and also I did note that this version of the uh, manual said it had XY mode, uh, in fact it doesn't. Um, and I also found an undocumented function, um, so stick around to the end of the video to find out what that is. Now this is currently configured to boot straight into the multimeter, as you can see here. But what I thought was quite remarkable is how fast it starts up. If we compare it to a um, standard multimeter like this Fluke 79, and I switch them on at the same time, you'll notice that the Fenersi boots up just a little bit faster than the Fluke, actually. Let's just try it with another multimeter, the Uni T. Start up, you see it's faster, quite amazing. Okay, so the first thing I'd like to look at is how you navigate the menu system and enter the configuration. So you press menu and then you can move the cursor left and right to cycle through the different basic functions. So you've got oscilloscope, signal generator, multimeter, and configuration. Let's go into configuration. So you've got language selection, then you've got volume, auto shutdown. This is useful. Remember that from the last video, this is very power hungry. LCD brightness, reducing that might also extend battery life. And then you've got the do what you boot up into by default. I've got the multimeter set. And then the software version. Okay, so let's have a look at the multimeter function. By default, it comes into auto mode where it tries to determine what function you're going to take. But you can press one of these four keys on the top. You've got the voltage ohm key, as you can see here, which allows you to toggle through the different types of voltage reading, AC, DC, and resistance. 
and then the next key toggles between diode on off and continuity test and capacitance. Then the next key toggles between temperature, uh, centigrade, Fahrenheit and live voltage. We'll come to that a bit later. And then finally you've got the amps and milliamps, uh, both high current, low current for both AC and DC. Now I'm about to go through a set of accuracy tests for the multimeter. So just here's a quick recap. You notice the DC voltage and resistance is about 0.5% generally, plus three digits. Uh, AC voltage is around 1%, DC current 1.2, uh, AC current 1.5, and capacitance, well, good luck to you. But that's not unusual. For Capacitance is notoriously difficult to measure accurately. Now, as a basis for testing the resistance accuracy, I'm going to be using my homemade precision attenuator that I've built from a series of um, precision resistors. And I'm going to be confirming those values, first of all, with this um, LCR meter from DER, the DE5000. So you can see you've got 50 ohms as a first resistor in the network. And that's within tolerance. That's good. The next one is 500 ohms. You see that checks out exactly the LCR. And that's also within tolerance. So, so far so good. The next one in the network is one kilo ohm. Again, checks out exactly on the LCR. An impressive result from the Fenosi, again in spec. And finally, five kilo ohms. Okay, three or four ohms over. And again, that's within spec. Now, without using precision resistors, I'm just doing a comparison between um, a 100K resistor between the LCR and the Fenosi. So they check out to be within the spec in terms of a comparison. At one mega ohm. Also within spec. Level at which the continuity buffer switches on and switches off. So I'm just bringing down the resistance. Okay, let's just confirm what that resistance is. Around 41 ohms. And then let's we'll check where it switches off. It looks like around 56. Yep, 56. So yes. I think that's okay. Check the voltage at which it reports that diodes switch on, i.e. their forward voltage. First, I'm going to check it in this peak detector. So this is a red LED. And you see the forward voltage is about 1.9. I put a couple of short leads, you can see, uh, which are quite useful for testing capacitors and components. 
okay 1.8 that's okay it's probably using a different forward current which is why we're seeing a bit of a different voltage and you can see it's a it's a lighting up the LED as well when we're testing it so that's useful okay so this has got a forward voltage of 2.77 And for now, see, we've brought it 2.6. Again, lighting the LED. Perfect. Yeah. Standard silicon diode. Forward voltage is about 0.66. Nurse is reporting 0.59, a bit on the low side, but again, it's probably using a different forward voltage, test voltage. So I think that's fine. Now, a really important test, of course, we should do is test the lower temperature limit. On the uni T, we should be around 50, minus 50 degrees. Yep, that's good. Now uh, let's do the same for the Fenersi. It should be about minus 50 degrees also. I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit, sorry. Okay, let's give it a whiz. Yeah, it got to minus 52, I saw it. Brilliant. Now for a capacitance test. I don't have any precision capacitors, so I'm just going to do a comparison again between the LCR and the Fenersi. So first of all, I think this is a 20 picofarad, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, there we are, 19.2. That's a, the LCR measures at frequency of one gigahertz. I'm not sure about the Fenersi. It can't detect under auto mode, so we're going to have to help it by selecting capacitance. Notice it's measuring a bit high. That's because it'd be measuring the 20 PF capacitor, picofarad capacitor, plus its internal or inherent resistance. So we can compensate for that by using the relative function, which is a really handy function to have when you're measuring small values. So what we do is we, in capacitance mode, we press the save button and it effectively zeroes the capacitance value when no capacitor is attached. So then, we attach the capacitor we want to measure. And there we have it, 20 picofarads. Excellent. Switch relative off. Now I want to show you how that relative capacitance feature works when used with a variable capacitor, which I retrieved from an old radio. So I set it about halfway. I go into relative mode to zero it. And then you can see it goes to zero and then I increase and you can see the capacitance increasing as you as, as you'd expect. But when I go below the point where I made the relative measurement, it doesn't go negative. To the next capacitor, 
I think this is 10 nanofarad. Yep, that checks out well. Actually, the relative function is not really required when measuring something big in comparison with the inherited capacitance. So we'd only use it for small values. I think this one is 100. Yep. So this is an electrolytic 100 microfarads. Oh, flat battery. Okay, with a new battery, let's try again. So this is a hundred microfarad electrolytic. That's at one kilohertz. Probably should try it at one hundred hertz. Okay, ninety five. <laughs> And on the Fenersi, 100. Well, okay. Like I said, it's difficult to measure electrolytics and capacitors accurately, especially electrolytics. You kind of just want to know they're in the ballpark, really. This one is a 1,000 microfarads. a bit low, 809. On the Fenersi, 886, 884, no, that's okay. Now let's just have a quick look at the different types of waveform and frequency these two devices put across a capacitor to determine their value. So the LCR is currently set to put a one kilohertz waveform. You can see it's exactly one kilohertz and it appears to be an almost perfect sine wave. The Fenersi, same capacitor, 10 nanofarad, puts out a kind of a triangular shaped waveform at 410 hertz. Then for a smaller capacitor, it's putting out 4.6 kilohertz. And then for 100 microfarad capacitor, uh, 1.36 hertz, so just over a second. So you see different frequency of waveform depending on the capacitor it's trying to measure. Now I'm going to do a voltage accuracy check. On the left, I have a voltage reference. And then the output of the voltage reference, I have this uni T meter as a sanity check. This is 2.5 volts. That connects to a precision attenuators, which are later used to divide the voltage between 0 0.2, 0 0.1 or 0.01. But currently they're all in parallel, these meters. So you see the Fenersi is also measuring 2.5 volts, as is the Fluke on the right, which has a valid calibration certificate. Up to the next level, so we've got 5 volts, also 5.01 on the Fenersi, that's great, and 5 volts on the Fluke. Next up is 7.5. So the Fenersi is reading a little bit higher, but not too bad, and the Fluke looks good, 7.49. Finally, 10 volts, and the Fenersi is looking good at 10.02, and Fluke is spot on. Now I'm going to use the attenuator to divide that 10 volt input reference to check some other voltages. Okay, first of all, divided by 5 or 0. times 0. 0.2 should give us 2 volts. 
nurse is almost spot on, as is the fluke. And double check, still a 10 volt input. Next up, we got um, times by 0.1, still 10 volt input. And we should have one volt at the finercy and the fluke. And that's great. Finally, it's 0.01, so we should have 100 millivolts. So it's still 10 volts on the input, exactly 100 millivolts on the finercy and the flute. That's excellent. So now we're going to change the input, the reference, down to 2.5 volts. So then we should see 25 millivolts on the finercy, which we do, and 25 millivolts on the flute. That's excellent. Now what I'm going to do is test the sensitivity of the finercy by engaging the variable resistor which is a multi-turn wire round resistor and then I'm going to slowly bring the voltage up um, until it starts registering on the finercy So you can see on the fluke, it's already measuring 0.7 of a millivolt. One millivolt, still nothing on the finercy. Two millivolt, two point, ah, okay, now we can see it on the finercy. So minimum is around two millivolt. Let's take up to four on the fluke. Finercy seems to be a little bit behind. We've got five millivolts on the fluke, four millivolts on the finercy. Let's take it a bit further. Six on the fluke, five on the finercy. Seven on the fluke, six on the finercy. You see, be like a millivolt behind at this low voltage range. Let's take it to ten. Nine on the finercy. I mean, it's a small amount when you think about it in absolute range, but okay, twenty millivolts on the fluke. And now twenty millivolts on the finercy. I'm now going to check the DC voltage accuracy on the oscilloscope. So I have a 10 volt input reference again, and that's connected to the oscilloscope channel one via BNC to four meters jack connector. And then I also have this flute multimeter connected to the same input. Um, you can see here that I've got the oscilloscope set up so that it's on DC coupling, uh, two volts per division, um, and times one input, because I'm not using a times a 10 probe, of course. And then I've got the voltage level set at the bottom of the grid. So it's two volts per division. So 10 volts, it should go up to the fifth line. So I'm gonna move the input to the 10 volt reference and you can see that the voltage has indeed moved up to the fifth line or the trace i should say and if you look at the parameters it's saying vmax is 9.87 so it's a bit down 13.13 down and voltage rms also the same of course So a little bit low. And then I'm going to reduce the voltage to 2.5 volt input. 
So you can see now that we're measuring 2.18 volts, which is substantially under. That's not good. What was that? Yeah, it's fluctuating a bit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the range on the oscilloscope. I'm going to change the scale, I should say. So five volts input, and this is measuring 4.74. 7.5 volts input, measuring 7.38. So it's a bit under in every case. Well, you can see if I can improve the accuracy by changing the scale. So now we've got it 500 millivolts. 2.49 measuring is the input now, so it's a lot more accurate. Yeah, so reducing the the set the scale to a lower voltage per division improves the accuracy. So now we've got five volts input, which is still only showing four point three. Okay, we change it to one volt. We got four point nine four. That's okay. It's not too bad. I'm now going to use the variable resistor or potentiometer again to test the sensitivity of the 20 millivolts per division range. So you can see the voltage being measured by the fluke on the right, which is in parallel with the input to channel one on the Fenersi scope. Those spikes are noise coming from um, the contacts of the variable resistor. There's no capacitor across the, the swipe. We've got 10 millivolts in the input. You can just see it's registering on Vmax 10 millivolts. Three meters in parallel. And I'm measuring um, a high voltage. At, well, high voltage this is the highest <laughs> voltage I've got available to me uh, for a DC power supply. So you can see um, that the Fenersi's within tolerance of the calibrated meter, which is the fluke in the middle. Now I'm going to just select Hall to show you what that does. I'm going to switch off the power. And you can see that the voltage displayed on the Fenersi is held. switch off hold and it goes back to zero also. Okay, so I'm, I'm okay with that. The amp current range. So I've got a 2.5 volt reference uh, through five kilo ohms and all these meters in series. So I've got five milliamps, sorry, 0.5 milliamps. So that's good. Then I've got five volts divided by 5,000 ohms. So I just have one milliamp. Okay, wow. looks good. And then I've got 7.5 divided by 5,000, so it's at 1.5 milliamps, looks good also. Finally, 10 divided by 5,000 ohms, so 2 milliamps, so that all looks good. Micro amp range. So I've got a 10 volt reference through a 1 mega ohm resistor. All these meters are in series again on the milliamp per micro range, but look at this. The Fenersi is showing minus six, minus seven micro amps before I do anything, and the others are zero. So there's a calibration issue there. So what have we got? We got around 9.7 on the unit T, 10 on the fluke, and only four. Now that's probably because of the minus six 
offset that we had. So there's a bit of a calibration problem there. Next up, I'm doing the high current range. Again, they're all in series, but there's some in the high current inputs. Um, so at the moment, you can see we've got one amp and they pretty much exactly align. That's fantastic. Let's take it up. Okay, at two amps, the finesse is looking good. It's in almost exactly in alignment with the calibrated fluke. And at 4 amps it looks great too. Okay, I'm happy with that. Now I'm going to check this live function. Not sure how it works. It says use the um, volts ohm input. Now is it capacitive? Uh, nope, doesn't seem to be. Let's just try putting one and probe in. Ah, uh, there we have it. You see in the middle of the display there? I thought there would be some sort of tone, but nothing. Okay, that's what it is. That's what you get. It's measuring the AC voltage from the main supply. So, the frequency is a little bit down compared with the flute, but still with intolerance, that's fine. Here is on their high current inputs, uh, measuring AC current, and the tolerance on here I think is about two percent. So the Fenersi is doing fine in comparison with the Fluke. RMS measurement accuracy. So our signal generator generating a um, a fifty hertz signal. Um, and the RMS value, according to my cyclone scope, is 4.34 volts, 12.64 peak to peak. So we should be getting 4.34. So you can see the fluke is 4.3, it's largely in agreement, but the uni T and the finesse a bit under is 4.2. Okay, now I'm going to check the RMS input as measured on the Fenersi scope input compared with the Siglet. Siglent, I should say. So we got 4.31 RMS, 12.4 volt uh, peak to peak. And then we have on the Fenersi, okay, uh, 12. 0.59 peak to peak looks okay. Frequency 50 hertz. Uh, v max, which is peak, yes. Okay. V RMS minus 0.15 volt. That's not right. What's going on there? That looks like V average. Let's let's enable V average or display V average. See what that is. Okay, so VRMS and V average are the same, yeah, so looks like a bug. Um, but I found you get over it by changing the coupling to AC. So now it's AC, you have a look, and VRMS is 4.19, which is about right. So there you have it. Now going to focus on the oscilloscope function, starting with the basic navigation. So this symbol here indicates whether your scope is running or not. 
This is the time base setting. And this indicates whether channel one or channel two is selected for use by the controls. This indicates whether the function generator is running or not. And this, of course, is a battery indicator. So, so at the bottom here, you can see you've got the parameters for channel one and channel two. And you've got channel one and two above each other here. And you can see that channel one is one volt per division times one AC couplings, as is channel two. Um, and then we've got the triggering, uh, so it's on auto, rising edge, and channel two. Um, and you can see that you've got channel one select at the moment. And if I press the up and down, it changes the sensitivity. So the maximum sensitivity is 20 millivolts, and minimum 10 volts, minimum, maximum, whichever way you look at it. And then if you change to channel two, then those same controls operate on channel two instead. And then left and right shifts the waveform time base. To a maximum of 10 seconds. Press auto at any time, which is a great feature to quickly establish the waveform Did something visible. So we can then press a the trigger menu. You can see that we've got modes of um, auto, uh, normal and single shot. And you can track, of course, you can trigger on channel one and channel two. And you've got edge triggering on rising edge or falling edge. Now, if you select the cursor button, and of course channel one is selected, so now moving the up and down controls moves the trigger level. So if I move it down below the waveform, it will lose triggering. Move up so it just meets the bottom of the waveform, then it will regain triggering. Okay. You see that? Symbol has now changed to a cross, which means we now have the ability to move the selected channel. Then you can see we've got the parameters, uh, which you can set by toggling them on, on and off. You just move through and you toggle them on or off using the cursor keys. So quite intuitive, easy to use interface. I actually quite like it. I think for Nursi you've done a great job. You don't even need to read the manual and you're using it in a couple of minutes. Now we're going to look at the bandwidth um, performance on a single channel. So I've got a function generator on the right here, which is um, dual loaded. One load 50 ohm into the Finerci, another load 50 ohm into the Siglin. Um, and I'll start at one megahertz. Um, we got a um, voltage peak to peak of around two volts times 0 0.707 or minus 3d we'd be looking at about 1.4 volts peak to peak see the frequency is uh, exactly one megahertz So we'll start to increase two megahertz. Four. I think I'll press auto again. But 
look how the waveform is a bit shaky. The triggering doesn't seem quite right. You can see on the siglin, it's nice, it's nice and stable. But on the finursi, it's 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 shaking around a bit. I'm surprised at that. I thought with the FPGA, we wouldn't see that. Up to eight megahertz. One point eight two volts peak to peak. Ten megahertz. Yeah, it's really shaky. That's a shame. But you can see we're well above the 1.4 volts minus 3D point. So nothing wrong with that bandwidth specification. Okay, let's see how far above 10 megahertz we can take it. So we're now at 12, 13, Fourteen, fifteen. Okay, fifteen is getting close to the one point four volts peak to peak. So you're kind of minus three D. But look how shaky it is. I wouldn't say it's at all usable above that. Now, using sine waves to test bandwidth on oscilloscope doesn't really give a clear picture. Uh, square waves um, are often used, of course, when we're using um, digital circuits. So it's important that a scope can resolve square waves properly. Let's see how it does. So at 4 megahertz, you can see it's very shaky. Um, 5 megahertz still just resembles, resembles a square wave. By the time you get to 7, the square waves resembling a sine wave and that's because all of the harmonics uh, or odd harmonics which are required to create a square wave will be filtered out by the limited uh, bandwidth of the analog input stage on the oscilloscope done a little setup where I've got the Finursi in signal generator mode producing a hundred kilohertz signal 2 volts peak to peak sine wave going into the attenuator. It's highly attenuated, goes through a capacitor and goes into this software defined radio, which is then linked to my laptop, which is running a spectrum analyzer application. So it's a bit like an oscilloscope, but it shows the signal in the frequency domain rather than the time domain. So there's 200 kilohertz going up to, on the right to 2 megahertz. So you can see there one megahertz in the middle. Now, if you look to the left here, that, that peak is the 100 kilohertz sine wave. Now, if I change it to the square wave, look at all these additional peaks. These are the odd harmonics. You can see there's 300, 500, 700, and so on. There's all the odd harmonics which are required to make up the square wave. Put it back to sine wave, those harmonics disappear. Put it back to square wave, they reappear. So you see the constituent parts of a square wave are these harmonics, which extend way past the fundamental frequency. And that's why you need high bandwidth to resolve a square wave. Yeah, I've got both channels connected with a terminator to a function generator. Um, currently I've got triggering set channel one. Um, both are set identical, 1 megahertz, even though channel 2 is shown 0.94 for some reason. Let's increase channel 1. Channel 1 at 5 megahertz now. Press auto. I don't know what's happened to the frequency of channel 2, showing 0. Strange. Should be 1 megahertz. 
Let's increase frequency of channel two anyway. Bring it up to five. Okay. Let's increase channel one again. Now at 10, 12, that's 10, it's very shaky, and channel 2 is all over the place in terms of frequency, I don't know why that is, it looks like only channel 1 is meaningful in terms of accurate parameters or measurements it seems that really this is only useful for the channel which it's being triggered on let's change the trigger to channel 2 and now you see we have the opposite case Channel 2 is more stable and the frequency is correct. And meanwhile, channel 1 has is extremely shaky and the frequency is incorrect. So really, in dual channel, it's only useful for the channel that you're triggering on in terms of parameters and stability. Finally, let's have a look at the function generator. So this button switches on or off the function generator output. We got sine wave square, triangular, half, four wave, noise, and DC, which goes up to 3.3 volts. So if we look at how we set the frequency, it's a bit like the TC3, the component tester oscilloscope that I reviewed before. So you select the digit and then you can just move the digit up or down to change the frequency, like so. It's okay actually. And then of course you've got the other parameters um, in addition to frequency, uh, which are applicable depending upon the type of waveform you've you selected. So you obviously got amplitude, which is actually peak to peak, by the way, duty cycle where it applies. And now you can see the waveforms. They're a bit buggy. Sometimes the waveforms show up, sometimes they don't. Now I don't know why you can set the frequency on noise. That looks like a bug. Surely that's not right. So yeah, it's a bit buggy. And DC up to 3.3 volts, which is useful for logic circuits. Now we couldn't find anything which specifies the output impedance of the function generator. So what we can do, we can get a scope to measure the open circuit voltage, i.e. no load across it, uh, from the signal generator. Uh, and then we can load it and then reduce the resistance of that load until the output voltage is exactly half of the open circuit output voltage. Then RL equals ZO. So we can determine what ZO or the output impedance is. So we've got 10 kilohertz now, two volts, peak to peak. Output connected to channel one of the oscilloscope on the one hand and on the other hand, connected to this precision attenuator again. Um, now I've got, now what I'm going to do is I can use this potentiometer to load the output. Um, so I'm going to measure that voltage, two volts open circuit, and then loaded, I'm gonna measure it again and reduce that load until the output voltage reaches half the original. And that will give me the resistance on the potentiometer of the impedance, the output impedance of the function generator. So I'm going to reduce this now until it gets to one volt. 
more or less. So when the voltage at the output is half what it was open circuit, it means the load resistance is the same as the internal resistance of the function generator. It's like a voltage divider with equal resistances. Okay, and then I'm going to switch to multimeter mode move the resistance of the potentiometer to the ohms input and I see okay so it's 100 ohms so the output impedance of the function generator is 100 ohms that's unusual it's normally 50 for these type of applications hmm okay now I'm going to have a look at the quality of the output signal of the function generator so I've got 2 megahertz at 2 volts peak to peak. It looks nice and clean. Um, and this isn't loaded, by the way. And I can see the signal is showing 1.92, so it's quite accurate. But what's that funny rippling? You see that moving squiggly thing near the top of the sine wave? Can't really see it on the Fenersi. Hmm. That's strange. Try a square wave. Bit of ringing that you can see on the Siglent. Can't really see it on the Fenersi, I guess, because of the limited bandwidth. Let's try a triangle. Hmm, it's present on all waveforms. I wonder what's causing that. Okay, well, this is not such a big issue for me. Uh, the frequency is accurate, the amplitude is quite accurate, and for the type of uh, application I'd use it for, this is not an issue. You would. I'm now going to look at how we would adjust the compensation on a probe with the Fenersi. So, times 1 times 10, which is the most common, you put it on times 10, and then you use this little screwdriver to adjust a little variable capacitor, even the body, of the probe or near the the jack. In this case the supplied probes have got the compensation capacitor in the jack. Other probes like this one here had the compensation capacitor hidden in the body of the probe itself. But they both do the same thing. Now most desktop oscilloscopes have a probe compensation output like this which is a one kilohertz output typically. Um, and you can see the trace of the output and what we would do we would adjust this compensation capacitor to get a nice square wave so you can see that we can make the leading edge higher or lower like this and when it's just nice and square it's properly compensated for that scope in the case of the Fenersi there's no dedicated output so we put the function generator to generate a one kilohertz signal, and then we attach the probe between channel one and the function generator output, and then adjust channel one. So we get a couple of cycles of the square wave. Remember to set it at one kilohertz. And you see I've got channel 1 set to around 500 millivolts per channel uh, times 10 DC coupled and I can make that adjustment just like you do on a desktop scope. There you have it. Now I wanted to show you a few calibration functions. This first one is documented. If you hold down the auto button 
in the oscilloscope mode, it goes into this calibration mode. Don't know what it does exactly. It takes a few seconds. You're warned not to use the oscilloscope when this is happening. Otherwise, you might have to recalibrate it. And then in the multimeter mode, this is undocumented. If you hold down channel one and channel two at the same time, it goes into this calibration mode. Now I looked at the Chinese trans, the translation of the Chinese word there that means calibration. But it fails. I did it before and it said pass and it entered a millivolt mode, which you don't normally have access to. But then when I tried it again, it comes up as failed, as you'll see in a minute. So I'll contact Fenersi and try and find out why it does that and how I can get it back to a pass. You see, error three. So at least until we find out more about it, I don't recommend you use this function. It's probably intended for factory-based calibration as part of the production. Um, and using it without knowing what it does or how it should be used might render the calibration of your multimeter to be um, out or inaccurate. Now, it's all very well doing these tests and measurements, but what's it actually like to use? Um, what's the bottom line? So um, I thought it was very good in terms of being able to uh, fault find low frequency stuff like uh, AM radio that I've got here. I really appreciate the auto function. Um, you just um, find the signal and then press auto to resolve it very quickly. So it means it's quite quick to trace signals around something. You see, you press auto, done. That's really handy and quick. Um, measuring something a bit more complicated, like a composite video signal, uh, not so good, actually. It's easy to resolve in a bench top scope like this, um, but it was just frustrating, to be honest, on the Fenersi. Um, and I pretty much gave up on it. So complex signals like this, which is kind of a mixture of analog, high frequencies, digital, no. So finally, I did a little uh, test program running on uh, Arduino Nano uh, to test the stability of the triggering and its practical usage or application to nano circuits or Arduino circuits, I should say. So if you look at the trace here, um, the top trace is the trace which is being triggered on and the Arduino and one of its outputs is producing like a, a little pulse around 180 nanoseconds. And then straight after um, on the lower trace you can see here, another output is producing a series of pulses between zero pulses and four pulses depending on the number of elapsed seconds. So. The top trace is like a trigger, and the lower trace, or channel 2, is a series of pulses, which is always time-related to the pulse on the upper trace, or channel 1. So the time between them should be deterministic and always stable, but does the triggering and the scope show that? Uh, and there we can see the pulse has been generated as shown on the 200 megahertz desktop. So nice and stable. Not jittering. And then on the Fenersi, firstly you can see some of the pulses on the lower trace of channel 2 seem to be missing. They don't seem to go, go up in sequence every second. So not quite right. It's really struggling there with those 190 180 nanosecond pulses. Now I've increased the pulse to around 5 microseconds and you can see it's a lot more stable. So I think the limit for using the Fenersi in this application is around 5, 5 or so microseconds. Less than that becomes a bit unpredictable. How we download software. So go to software support and download um, and then click on the firmware upgrade tab. Now you'll see that it's incorrectly described here as a user guide, it's not. But download the PDF and it's actually the software. So you get a .rar file, 
which you then this is an archive compressed file which you need to then um, unarchive. Now I had to use WinZip to make this work. If I tried the native Windows unarchive tool, it didn't work. So I'm just using the evaluation version here of WinZip. So we've got our RAR file. Unzip it to your chosen or preferred location. Press cancel there. And you see you've got um, two files there. You've got a folder. You've got a, a file there which is the release note in Chinese, but you can translate that in Google. And then you've got two bin files. So those are the binary executables. Choose the EN for English. Then you need to put the uh, Finercy in boot mode. Hold down menu and then touch on power and you go into the bootloader. Connect to your computer and you'll see a folder pop up in a drive in the Finercy. And then you copy that bin file to that folder within the Finercy and it will upload and start the new version. Go to the configuration menu, uh, go down to about, and check the expected version of software is being used. And that's it. Well, that brings us to the end of the review. Uh, well, that took a lot longer than I expected, but uh, it just goes to show how much functionality is crammed into this device. So it's, <laughs> it's definitely a good value from that point of view of anything else. So uh, what are the key issues with this? Um, before I get stuck into the ones raised in the performance review, do note that I did also raise some uh, pros and cons in my hardware review video. And you haven't seen that already, uh, please do go and check that out and we do a hardware specific review. So from a functional performance uh, perspective, first of all, it was a shame to see how inaccurate the measurements were uh, in dual channel mode on the channel which was not being triggered upon. As you saw that the, the trace which was not being triggered upon I was moving all over the place, um, the measurements were inaccurate and pretty much unusable. The other thing was that the oscilloscope inputs um, are not cat rated unfortunately, which means they cannot withstand a uh, high energy transient impulse, um, which is a, a safety concern. Um, and also that the oscilloscope input share a common ground with the USB port. That is, they're connected together, right? So imagine you're holding the scope um, and somehow you've got a finger touching the USB port um, or you've still got a loose USB charging cable coming out of it um, and then you're probing around the hot side or high voltage side of a switch mode power supply, for instance. Um, you could have a really high voltage from that switch mode power supply go through the ground side of the probe um, and out through the USB port and give you a shock or damage some equipment. Uh, so because of that, I don't recommend using the scope inputs on this device uh, for high voltage applications. The multimeter is different, is cat rated, um, but not the, not the oscilloscope side. Triggering can be jittery and unstable sometimes, um, even on the channel which is being triggered upon. Um, and we saw that it struggles with pulses shorter than a, a few microseconds. Um, but, you know, if you're using it for general Arduino work um, and uh, low frequency analog stuff, um, i.e. not radio frequency stuff, um, it's just fine. You can even actually use it for lower frequency uh, radio applications such as AM radios and that sort of thing. Uh, it's fine for that. Uh, it's a shame it doesn't have a millivolt range. Um, that would have been good. Although I do know that when <laughs> I came across this undocumented uh, calibration function, uh, after the calibration sequence, after it passed, um, it went into a millivolt range. 
So it suggests that it can do millivolts, um, but it's just not made available for some reason. Um, another one which is not a biggie um, is it doesn't have a dedicated output for probe compensation, um, but as you saw, you can just use the function generator to serve that purpose. Um, and a relatively minor one, I guess, is the function generator doesn't have a standard 50 ohm output impedance, uh, rather it's a uh, 100 ohms, but again, not a big one. Now actually, this thing has grown on me. Um, I'm actually quite liking it. Let, let us see why. Well, first of all, I think it's uh, well designed and easy to use. Truly, you, you get to know your way around this really quickly, even without reading the manual. Um, I think that Finercy have done a fantastic job to make this so intuitive. It's got good accuracy as well. Um, as you saw, often uh, exceeding the stated specifications. And in the case of the oscilloscope, we note that the analog bandwidth appeared to be around 13 megahertz, exceeding the stated 10 megahertz. So I think it's a, um, uh, an honestly specified device. It doesn't pretend to be something that it isn't, and I appreciate that. Um, I'm also pleased at how quick it is to boot. I thought this would be quite slow to boot up, but it's actually faster than the dedicated multimeter as we saw in our tests. I think the um, upload, the ability to upload screen snapshots is, is handy, it has its uses, or just to store some measurements for future reference, that, that's appreciated. But do know it is just a screen snapshot, you can't upload the data. And overall, I think that what Fenersi have done at this price is really quite amazing, given that it's got good build quality, um, good accuracy, good usability. Um, so, and I also think that the, the manual's good and the support from Fenersi. So all in all, um, I would really recommend this, but noting that it does have its limitations, right? So as we noted that, um, you have to understand where it's inaccurate, where it, it can be trusted, where it can't. Um, uh, most importantly, be wary of its limitations in terms of the protection around the oscilloscope inputs. I wouldn't recommend using it on high voltage. But other than that, i got to say, i got to admit that I love using this thing. Um, I've, <laughs> I've really come to uh, be quite fond of it. And um, I will definitely be using this when I go over to see a friend to help them diagnose a fault with something. Um, it's great that I've got all these three things together in, in one little package. And most importantly, I trust the readings I get on the multimeter. If I didn't, then it wouldn't be very useful because I'd also I'd always be reaching to another multimeter to check the values. But... Um, as we saw in the test, it's something that can be trusted, it's relatively accurate. Um, and for that, it will deserve a, a place on my bench and uh, I look forward to using it. And with that, it's just for me to say thank you for watching. Um, if you found this video useful, please give me a like and do subscribe. And did, did you buy one of these? Uh, what do you think? I'd love to know how you got on with it. I'd love to hear your comments. Until next time, take care and look after yourselves and I'm sure we'll do another video soon.